confession and before dinner and before opera performance. <laughs> so I would like to be sure. Uh, and I would like to talk actually on the subject which came back to me after 10 years, so like a boomerang. Uh, I would like to um, uh, put a final statement what I have on the subject. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the emission from uh, accretion disks uh, in two different uh, systems, AGN and galactic black hole candidates. And this figure probably is familiar to you. I just want uh, to put attention that the disk temperature in AGN is of the order to 10 to the 5 kelvins, and in the galactic black hole candidates of the order of 10 to the 7, even in a region. So therefore, the disk emission in AGN uh, is uh, seen more in optics UV uh, and uh, for galactic black holes in X-rays. It was very nicely uh, today referred by Chris Dome, so probably everybody remembers. Um, and what I'm working on, I'm making radiative transfer calculations in such a accretion disk atmospheres with uh, some people. Th those are people who, who, with who I collaborated recently. And since many years, I'm collaborating with this sketch that you have accretion disk, X-ray source, and I compute this radiative interaction between hard X-rays and accretion disk. I'm computing this using radiative transfer computations. Radiative transfer is, up to now, it is a really classical problem in astronomy. Right now, uh, very common <coughs> in stars. But first of all, it, was formu it is also used in oceanography, physics of atmospheres. First, of, mm, the first radiative transfer problem was formulated in 19 05 by Schuster, and uh, he uh, published the paper Radiation Through the Foggy Atmosphere. And he was already emphasizing here that the, uh, the effective thickness of stellar atmospheres may be great compared with the air share, so the effect of scattering may be very important. And he included the scattering in radiative transfer. So up to now, the general radiative transfer is solved by the set of the equations. Like here, radiative transfer. And it is very important what, what Ivan Huveni said today, that your radiation field is convolved with matter structure. OK, so a radi radiation field shows you how you can iterate your matter structure. So I'm going to talk today about uh, this problem solved in this way. So iteration between structure of matter and radiation field, right? Um, here in, in those two equations, also external irradiation here is seen as a term. External irradiation also is here in emission coefficients. And the, the probably different codes differ by, uh, for sure, they differ by uh, the, how the source function looks like. And for ionization processes, there are two ways to treat it, non-LTE and LTE approach. They differ, of course, non-LTE approach is better because it takes into account non-local photons, which probably affect ionization. And of course, the boundary conditions are very important, so upper, Bandari condition, it says that all uh, outgoing flux should be emitted from the tau equation zero. And lower Bandari condition, we have full thermalization deeply in the atmosphere. And atmosphere needs some solar chemical composition, of course, the equation of state. Uh, so the, the work at, in laboratories is very, very useful. So what I'm doing, uh, computing uh, uh, accretion disk atmosphere on each radius from the black hole, distance from the black hole, I compute 
full radiative transfer problem and he, uh, together with Comptonization. And here you can see the temperature structure of different radii. And in case where is zero illumination and where the atmosphere is illuminated, so you can see so different behavior depending on uh, on the uh, on the value of energy generated in the disk and of course illuminated energy. And here some history, some past work. Uh, I'm going to emphasize only work here where which connects radiation field with structure. Okay, so. The first work was done by Laur Netzer, Eddington approximation and no Compton scattering. Then Ivan Hubeni, up to now he's working and making progress. And you could see today even illuminated atmosphere. But first of all, he was having not illuminated the creation disk. Shimura Takahara, they used only fully ionized gas. So no ionization was taken into account. The same in case of Dorer. Then the Ross and Fabian, they started to compute reflected spectrum right, by using Companitz equation, constant density on the constant density slab. Then in the same way, te more than 10 years ago, uh, three groups were calculating hydrostatic equilibrium, which changed your structure completely, right? And the recently, uh, Garcia and Kalma, uh, Javier Garcia is using extra code uh, to, um, to formulate uh, reflected spectrum. I'm going to talk about it later on. So ten year, more than 10 years ago, three papers were published showing the structure of illuminated atmosphere. Of course, they have a slightly different, slightly different assumptions. And here, Sergei Nayakshin, using extra code, he was jumping from this hot part of atmosphere through the, uh, through the ionization, very steep structure to the disk. And disk was isothermal, because he couldn't, extra doesn't go below 10 to 5 Kelvin temperature. So he couldn't compute really disk here. Ballantyne was using Ross and Fabian code. So the, the, spec, uh, the temperature structure was very shallow, and he never got the problem of thermal instability here. Sergei Nayakshin had to jump through the thermal instability. We could manage our computations all, only for low illumination, because otherwise we had this thermal instability problem. The thermal instability problem was first found by field long time ago, but it was very nicely emphasized by Kronik, Matki, and Tarta. So if we have illumination, only by illumination and by uh, comparing, uh, computing energy budget across atmosphere, we see that illumination produces un uh, unstable temperature profile. This shape depends on heavy elements, abundance of, uh, of the way how do you compute ionization. And uh, this should exist in any illuminated atmospheres, of course, if illumination field is high enough to produce this, this uh, <coughs> instability. And any radiative transfer computations cannot go through this instability because, because it cannot, sorry, it cannot pass through the unstable regions. So at that times, oops. at that times, like 10 years ago, we produced different spectra. Of course, spectra also depend on, uh, on uh, opacities included in codes, X star here, Ross and Fabian code, and here is the Titan code written by a French group in Madon. Anne-Marie Dumont and uh, Susie Collin. And at that time, everybody agreed that the emission lines seen in the disk, which goes uh, above, of course, continuum, is really narrow and small, OK? Uh, and it was just, I remember, it was like 18 AV equivalent width. It was really, really narrow. And what we have now? 
in XPEC model, we have Refion, Refion model, which computes the reflection from constant density slab. So it doesn't take into account this hydrostatic equilibrium. And the density is quite high. It's 10 to 15, right? But recent hydrodynamic simulations are showing us that the disk has really density structure. And even if it is not in hydro, but the density varies across a structure, right? And here is the recent very nice result by sneak down crawling at Noble. They are making MHD, MRI simulations with magnetic and gas pressure, but they completely neglect radiation pressure in those simulations. So if, we, if, if I compare the density at tau equal one, which goes from Smith Schnitttown simulation without Pirat, this density is, is uh, differs on three orders of magnitude from, from my 1D hydrostatic simulations with, with P radiation pressure taken into account. And uh, in my case, if I compare Shakura Sunayev disk Novikov Thorn, this density profile is quite similar, right? Computed in hydrostatic equilibrium. And here is, of course, tau equal one. And if, in my case of 1D simulations, I try to draw the radiation pressure, it looks like radiation pressure dominates, especially in the atmosphere. So it should be taken into account. And the last exercise, what I did with H Javier Garcia, I persuaded him to use his extra code to make the comparison of constant density slab of the order of 10 to 15 mm -hmm. to the my hydrostatic equilibrium density disk structure for the same <coughs> place, for the same accretion disk situated on 10 Schwarzschild radii. Um, and using his code, extra code, right? So first of all, temperature structure, of course, differs a lot. So this is disk density hydrostatic equilibrium, and this is constant density slab. Constant density slabs go deeper into the disk, into the, an atmosphere with this temperature jump, okay? and then the other issue is that when Javier Garcia tried to iterate this hydrostatic case, he couldn't convert iterations because the iterations were oscill temperature structure was oscillated between cold, colder branch and hotter branch, and he couldn't do it even in case of 10 Schwarzschild and in case of 20 it was even worse because the last iteration chose the called branch, and this is due to thermal instability. This is what I, what I had as a result 12 years ago. And if you, and of course, reflected spectrum also oscillates, and you don't know which one to choose, right? But finally, comparing the spectrum from constant density slab and from the disk density structure, they differ, they look more or less similar in the very interesting region for us when we fit reflection component and iron line and whatever. And if you look at the iron line, the iron line from constant density slab is huge here, right? This is the blue one. And from hydrostatic equilibrium, it's much much weaker. <coughs> and this is what I'm getting in my computations when I compute different cases here. Is the case of galactic black hole candidates. If I compute broadband spectrum, so the disk with reflection, this is 
the, the black one and, and, and the red one is the local spectrum, but here the green and magenta and the blue one are after ray tracing code. Uh, the code was written by Bożena Czerny. I'm almost finished, so if I look at this, First of all, after ray tracing, the, the, the continuum looks a little bit different, which everybody knows. But my line is not strong enough. And after relativistic smearing, almost completely disappears. So, uh, so of course, sometimes it's staying. For instance, here, this green one. You can see some jump here. Like, of this line. So, so my conclusion is that those observed huge iron lines uh, most probably may be a result of the fitting using the model who already has this huge iron line because of constant density slab and very high density, right? And in my, my second conclusion is that this is not a constant density for sure, right? Um, and this is everything what I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> Thank you.